Fresh Economic Thinking podcast. New ideas and analysis with Dr. Cameron Murray and Jonathan Gadir. G'day, Cameron. How are you going? Good, Jonathan. It's nice to be talking together again. Yes, nice to be back. Uh, I don't know about you, but I do not want to think about electricity. I do not want to shop around for it. I do not want to compare prices. I do not want to <laughs> deal with calls about switching providers. And you know what? I'm old enough to remember when none of that happened. And I don't think the world was a worse place when none of that happened. And I don't think I paid more of my income on electricity when none of that happened. What do you reckon? <laughs> well, welcome to the joys of consumer choice. Um, that I, maybe we've decided it's good for its own sake, but it sounds like you've had enough of it in this situation. Well, if it, I mean, it's not like, oh, the light is going to be so much nicer in my living room or the washing <laughs> machine's going to work so much better if I pick the right energy company. Yeah. Did you get the, the Mercedes quality electricity or the, or the cheap Chinese electricity? <laughs> Which was it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I got to tell you, I had a bit of a, a, an odyssey about my energy bill. Do you want to hear about it? Yeah, yeah, I really do. It, before you start, you yeah. realize back in 2008, the first ever article I wrote on the internet was about why phone and internet plans are meant to be difficult to understand. And it was I had the exact same drama trying to work out how to get a phone and mobile plan uh -huh. um, 16 years ago and i'd had enough of it then too and i can't believe that's what started me blogging and that's you've incredible. had the same experience with electricity <laughs> that's so interesting yeah. and, and it's it's, a, it's there somewhere on the internet or it's gone it's, it is there it still exists so I'll, we'll put a link in here eh? okay well i'll tell so you what about was my your Odyssey. experience yeah what what's going on Okay, so I got a very high energy bill. This is a couple of weeks after, a uh, couple of weeks before Christmas. So I noticed something mm -hmm. strange. It said on the bill, "You could be on a better offer," and the better offer was the name of the plan I was already on. What? Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went back and I checked. And back in July, when the prices all went up um, for everyone, my, my bill at the time and the subsequent one after that said nothing about any better offer. And I thought, well, you know, I did my homework at the time. I'm on the best plan there is for me. Uh, and I didn't think any more about it. Now I see after a gap of six months, they're telling me, oh, by the way, there's this other lower rate you could have been on with the same name. Why not move to it? So this started me on a journey of discovery about the, uh, what, what, um, I'm using Yanis Varoufakis's term, the energy retail pseudo market that I found mm. it, it's so absurd that it's exhausting. And I, I mean, I sp suspected there was a lot wrong with the pseudo market, but I found out the reality is much worse and also much funnier. Um, so so wow. I, I, I did so what did research. you end up doing? <laughs> so I did some research and I found that there was this thing, a regulation called like with the force of law, like a, a regulation in Commonwealth law, it's called the Better Bills Guideline. Part four mm. says you got to tell people on the bill or in any communication about prices if there's a better offer. And I thought, huh, so I've caught my energy company in breach of the Better Bills Guideline, right? They didn't okay. tell me that for two for two bills already, they didn't tell me that until that one before Christmas. So I complained and I, I got legalistic in my complaint. Probably wasn't your typical complaint. And the customer service reps did what they do. They fobbed me off with an upbeat waffle, ignored completely what I said in the email until I said the magic words, which is I'm going to take this up with the ombudsman. By the way, everyone, those are the magic words. Once you say I'm going to take this up with the ombudsman and you get taken seriously. So I got an email from one of the top compliance people in the company who suggested a phone call um, to, to clear everything up. And so I said, okay, um, but first I wanted to be prepared. So I did a heap, you know, a heap of more um, research and um, I realized that there was this thing called, you know, I did, did a lot of clicking around. I see this, this thing, government body called the Australian Energy Market Commission, the AEMC. 
they protect mm-hmm. consumers apparently in the energy market. And then there's this other they their responsibility is the National Energy Retail Law, the NERL, and the National Energy Retail Rules, the NERR. And then okay. there's so, this. So to be clear, these are national guidelines for electricity retail. It's not state based, yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's oh, very, okay. that's there's even more, more complex. Come. Yes, there's some oh, states that okay. are part of the national market and some states that aren't. Oh, my goodness. Um, okay. And then there's this thing called the National Energy Retail Objective, the NERO. Uh, I don't know what that is, but let's assume it's something okay. like, hoodie, like <laughs> you know, the objective is that should it benefit everyone, market should benefit everyone, right? Something like that, probably. So we got, so I thought, right. okay, I got this, but, but so no. So you've I read did, all I, these acronym rules. Yeah. Yeah. And all these different organizations who try and enforce the acronyms of rules yeah. before this phone call. <laughs> yeah, I just want to be prepared, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> and then and then I say, oh, no, there's this other organization. It's called the Australian Energy Market Operator, AMO. And they also protect consumers in electricity markets. And, but there's oh. this other organization that I see. Oh, there's this third government organization called the Australian Energy Regulator, the AER. Oh. And they also have part of their remit to protect consumers in energy. Um, and so oh, yeah. I think I got it now. There's three... Yeah, with all of this, like surely mm. I'm, I'm. There must now never be a bad thing happen to a consumer in the you energy market. You sound well protected, John. Um, yeah, very well, I'm well protected. protected. <laughs> exactly, I'm well protected, and they've got a national energy customer framework as well. So that's another thing on top of that objective. So that's an NECF, and that acts to protect small customers like me. So it's in like it's amazing how protected I am. Isn't it interesting? Who are they protecting you from? <laughs> the sh- the pseudo market that was created is that the whole thing? Anyway, well, yeah. that's a thing, right? It sounds yeah. bizarre, doesn't it? So, oh, right. um, but apparently, bad stuff still happens to energy consumers like me because mm-hmm. almost every state has a dedicated energy ombudsman just for resolving disputes between people and their energy retailer. Now I'm thinking, what sector of the economy has this? I think it's energy and it's telecommunications. (laughs) So you've got, you're saying there's three national regulators who have consumer protection objectives in electricity retailing plus state-based, what did you call them? Um, Ombudsman, this, ombudsman, t- state baits on ombudsman to protect customers' interests. Well, they're supposed to resolve in disputes. Yeah. Oh, so they have to resolve the disputes mm. using the national frameworks as what what is reasonable. Um, wow, uh, we're all getting protected from this thing that is pretty boring, which is just electricity and power lines, completely undifferentiated from any other electricity. Um, and yet we need all this protection as consumers. So bizarre. So you've learned all this. To I've learned all this. For a phone call. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And the government. Was, was, was there more? Or... <laughs> well, yeah, I found out the government actually forces the companies to pay, the energy companies, to pay a levy to fund all these ombudsman bodies. So customers are paying for these special organizations with very nicely paid staff with law degrees who are making career in consumer NGO sector. And I know about this because I worked for one of these organizations about uh, more than a decade ago. Um, and the people in this sector would just have no career, I guess, if the market was working. So, um, yeah. look, I, I guess every, every market needs rules, right? The, the trade practices and competition and consumer acts are really important ingredients for making a market function. So um, it's it's sort of true in every sector. You know, we've got um, uh, petrol price retailing. We've got a lot of anti-competitive conduct there. Consumers do need these rules in every sector. But I think you're right. For something that was historically so boring and simple, right, <laughs> like electricity connected to buildings that don't move around and don't change, it should be easy, right? This should be the easiest part of the economy, shouldn't it? Yeah. Well, um, well, I guess I've got an opinion, but I'll leave it 
till later. Um, yeah. So anyway, you've you've read up. Yeah, I've read up. So I have I have protections that you're entitled to that now you understand. So then I thought, yeah. So then I'm thinking, well, hang on. If I'm going to have this conversation based on, hey, you energy company have breached the Better Bills guideline, I better research that. So I researched the Better Bills (laughs) guideline, and um, well, the Australian Energy Regulator website helpfully tells me the story that the minister Angus Taylor on exactly actually on the day of recording is exactly four years ago he Mm -hmm. got upset about dishonest bait and switch tactics like people not being not being told that there was a better offer so he got annoyed and he said he ordered the regulator to come up with a rule saying that people had to be told there was a better offer out there correct um so the regulator the AER, are told okay this is what you have to do and they are very very accommodating to all the special pleading from the energy companies i've seen all the letters and the submissions about oh how we need a lot of time and we need to change our billings <laughs> and we need to change our it and it's really hard and da, 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 it's going to take a long time so there were there was a first version and then there was a second version and so from the time the minister saw a problem to the time the industry was forced to change their behavior by disclosing the existence of a better offer in a better bills guideline that was three and a half years wow um which i think is you know that's that's how that's how these things work right that's that's pretty much our system in isn't it it's like it is our system. We do have to hash these things out, but it seems like one of those. Well, I could go on. Uh, d- d- how regulatory hard... capture. Regulatory capture. Yeah. Is that... Well, I'll give you an example. So, if if a electricity retailer should be obliged to tell you that you're basically getting scammed by them because they've offered new customers better bills, better pricing, shouldn't that be true in the internet plans and your mortgage, for example? Like we're in that situation now in mortgages where people can just phone up their bank and if they kick up enough of a stink, they might get half a percent lower mortgage rate and that's going to save them thousands per year. Yes. Um, yes. Should banks not be obliged to do this as well? I actually was part of a, a review panel on consumer. Uh, it, was, it was to do with... Um, financial protection for for consumers and i and i said why don't we just oblige um, banks to put everyone on the best offer automatically Uh or have a standing offer like from the central bank whereas if they can't beat it you get that which is also done in electricity markets right we call this the um uh the regulated price or whatever and we calculate it each year and and basically everyone has to beat that price or consumers can just take that option. But yeah, like I, I think it's a great idea, three and a half years, and it sounds like they're not even implementing it. So what happened? <laughs> okay, so he, ca- he called me at that point of time and this polite compliance guy from my energy retailer was very blunt with me and I really respected that. And I think I think it's what, partly because of the very legalistic way I put my complaint in. <laughs> um, he explained to me they have two ways to change prices. One way involves a new contract where I have to agree and sign and go through formalities and another way they have, which doesn't involve that. Um, he said, look, it's, uh, you know, something we do that some, you know, sometimes we have two offers that happen to have the same name, probably not great, but we're allowed to do that. Um, but more importantly, for my legal gotcha was he said, well, you know, the better bills guideline version one, that never came into effect. Like that's what, mm-hmm. that's essentially what was, cause at the time that's what would have been in effect. That's what I thought was in effect. But he said, no, no, we, we negotiated that, that one, you know, we needed changes and the regulator agreed and bottom line was only version two ever came into force and they weren't, they didn't have to comply with it until late September of last year. So as the polite compliance guy very bluntly told me, even if there was a better offer, we were under no obligation to tell you about it until the end of September. And so we were in breach of nothing. And I was like, oh, okay. And he gave me the link to look it up for myself. Very nice of him. So, yeah, um, and I saw it on the regulator's website. The industry did a bunch of special pleading, tragic sounding letters, how hard it was to change their systems, blah, blah, blah. So that first version that I thought was in effect, version one, never came into effect. So, wow. um, so yeah, like the, 
my prediction, which is probably already happening, is now they'll be telling me the best offer, but they won't be telling me there is this other thing, not an offer, it's a, come up with a name, whatever you want, Cameron, a special discount, a special rebate, Mm -hmm. um, whatever. Nothing in the Better Bills Guideline compelling them to tell me about a special discount or a special rebate, right? Yeah, exactly. They'll just <laughs> rename rename the way they price things to avoid what's required by the new guideline. I think um, so. For the same economic outcome. Yeah, it sounds like it to me. And guess what? On the very day I was having my lovely exchange with the polite compliance guy before Christmas, the ACCC put out a media release, the latest in seemingly hundreds of similar releases and reports and inquiries saying... For like the hundredth time, many Australian households are on the more expensive electricity plan than they need to be, and changes are needed to improve competition in the electricity market. Oh, really? So all these, this, all mm. this, this labyrinth of bureaucracies and rules, and this is what we have. Nothing changes. Everyone's still kind of being scammed unless they're spending half their waking life policing their energy plan. Um, yeah, I mean, you've, you, you, you've, you know, how many degrees do you have to have in law and to understand what your rights are as a consumer to buy electricity? I mean, that's a bizarre situation, right? Like you did all this research and it turns out that no, there was this sneaky loophole where version one wasn't implemented and version two applies from September, 2023. And you're like, well, how, how does anybody even know any of this it's it's bizarre and here's the funny thing right Mm. um and 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 i i remember being at a uh, a competition policy conference at the gold coast and i'm gonna say this was in 2010 and just asking people if you know what the right price is that consumers should pay why don't you just force people to charge that price or Why don't you own the business and just charge that price? Why is there this pseudo market? And I really like that term that you've created. And you kind of, you've created it to get an outcome. It's not giving you the outcome you want. Well, why don't you just get the outcome directly? And in electricity, you know, it's an obvious one. Um, Why why don't we just do it? And and I, I say the same in banking, right? Like if you want people to, have no fee accounts, well, just give them no fee accounts at the central bank to anyone who wants one, right? And if you want banks to not charge uh, special fees for overdrafts or whatever, then why, you've got a public bank. Why don't you just offer people accounts with no overdraft fees? Why this elaborate system that is just exposing you to political pressures every time you change one, you know, comma in a sentence that might change the meaning of a rule when you know the outcome and you can do it directly it's it's very strange that's for sure yeah cameron do you think just maybe maybe it might be less hassle for everyone if the government just sold us all electricity and abolished all the shit that goes on now well like... look uh, to be honest there's there's a sort of first order effect where you're like that sounds obvious right we should do that um, the sort of second order effect is that um, maybe this is the problem, right? You create a market because there are there are competitive forces. People want to innovate um, to make more money. The problem with electricity is you cannot innovate the product. You have to sell the identical product of uh, you know 240 volt electricity to the house day in day out, right? You cannot innovate on the product. So what do you do? Well, you innovate on the pricing structure and the contract conditions and all those other things. And then you end up with this market of negotiating. You know, you're not competing by having better electricity, which you can do in, you know, in many sectors, you compete by making better products. Uh, And and there's actually a name for uh, this incentive. It's, I don't know who started it. They call it the Confusopoly. Mm-hmm. Your your incentives, because you can't differentiate your product, are to confuse your customers into thinking they're getting a great deal when they're not. And you sort of segment up the market into sort of gullible people, non-gullible people, and you charge them different prices and you 
the whole time tell them how great they are and how they're getting a good deal. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a bizarre situation. Um, yeah, it's really problematic in insurance. There's a study, for example, in the United States, very common in insurance because every contract has different conditions, right? Different, what what's flood versus overland flow versus storm damage, right? For your house insurance. And in the US, there was a rule that required every insurer who participated in a in in um, certain insurance markets to offer a default contract life insurance product. Yeah. So they had to offer a price on a default contract. They couldn't change any conditions. And what they found is those default contract prices got way down. Like the price of that standard contract got way down because they had to compete on price, not on bamboozling people with contract conditions. Whereas all the other contract, all the other insurance products they had, the prices stayed high because yeah. they could, you know, sort of trick people and target different markets and people with who are more scared of storms and sell different products to people who are more worried about fire damage um, and sort of manipulate it that way. So it's it's super interesting that it's so um, severe in electricity that we need three federal regulators and multiple state ombudsmen to combat this incentive to confuse us and rip us off. Isn't it wild? Yeah, yeah. It, the, the ombudsman thing, the existence of the ombudsman is necessitated by the um, you know, the distress and the outrage caused by the confusopoly strategy of um, profit making. Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, so, it's it's really, it's a, it's a hard one to solve. Yeah, we can provide electricity with a sort of state-owned entity. We could also uh, buy um, part ownership of the companies to sort of enforce some of these requirements because you'll have a seat at the table, you'd be on the board, et cetera, and avoid that uh, political bargaining as much. Um, these are all options too. Why are you kind of reticent about the just government? It's obvious. Like to me, it's obvious. It's a, it's a natural monopoly, utility, undifferentiated thing. Like what, why, why is I'm that? always cautious, right? Because you do end up, you do end up with a different set of incentives to mm -hmm. essentially hire lots of people, mm -hmm. right, in make make work positions to soak up the surplus you're getting as a public department or whatever. And you might say, well, there's not much markup, but there's not much markup on a bigger cost base because you've got this sort of inefficient department that is sort of stacking itself because it's got all this extra revenue. The, uh, there are incentives, right? And and I'm always wary of uh, a system where you have one organisation that that you cannot um, sort of let die, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So one option is having a state provider with alternative providers, in which case the alternative can, providers can come and go and live and die as as the market suits, but. It's, it's it's a little bit like, you know, Qantas, right? Qantas probably should have died many times, um, but we bailed it out many times. Mm. Um, and so the question is, well, we're just replicating. You know, if Qantas was a national airline, it would have the same bad incentives because we wouldn't let it die as a national airline and we'd be throwing money at it. And we're doing that for the private sector too. And, and that's not a great situation, but if we could let it die, that would be good. And, you know, another new airline would lease all its planes and try things a little differently, try organising the company differently. So I am, I am always wary. That's my sort of economics training. But then I look to places like road building, right? We have the Department of Main Roads just builds roads and it's very uncontroversial and no one really complains too much about yeah. the price of roads, right? It's not mm -hmm. even a thing. And we don't have to shop around, you know, oh, there's a toll in the left lane here on a Thursday afternoon and then, <laughs> um, you know, your contract says you can you know, drive for free on the weekends as long as you drive more than 100 kilometres during the week. Um, but, you know, now there's all these pink roads and, Pink roads have an extra charge. If someone who's a member of the blue roads wants to go and do that, right? That would be crazy. Uh -huh. And maybe it is crazy for electricity. Uh -huh. I guess I'm 
what I'm think, thinking is making sure that there are incentives um, built in so that um, we don't end up with just lazy overinvestment and and sort of bloated um, organizations. Uh, yeah, I it used to be better um, before the pseudo market came into existence. Uh, at least I wasn't wasting my time. Um, oh, so, yeah, so what happened? Well, yeah, he just said, look, why don't the, the compliance guy said to me, well, why don't I find out from our people when that better offer was created and we'll amend your bill and have you on that better offer from when it started. And mm -hmm. I was thinking to myself, this is so opaque. Even though other customers could have been on a better offer since July, there's no way I could know mm -hmm. that. Like, how could I know whether they're just making up a date? There's just no way. Um, no. And guess what happened? He said, he came back to me a day later and he said, oh yeah, that better offer. It started 21 days before it was offered to you on your bill. And so we're going to say that you started on that 21 days earlier and you're going to get a credit of $22.57. There you go. Oh, Bye -bye. wow. <laughs> um, thanks, what days buddy. of research, $22. <laughs> yes. And I, I, I decided, okay, I'm not going to let the regulators off the hook. I'm going to I'm going to email them. So I emailed the uh, Australian Energy Regulator, which says that, they, that they're the enforcers. They say they're the enforcers of the Better Bills Guideline and the National Energy Retail Law, blah, blah, blah. And it says that on their website that they have the power to monitor, investigate, enforce, and report on compliance with the retail law and rules and national energy retail, nas national electricity law and rules, national gas law and rules and associated regulations and guidelines, including the better bills guideline. So I was like, okay, right. I emailed them. I said to them, look, you've got nothing on your website that is report a problem with your retail, like report a breach of the mm -hmm. guideline. Why? How do you find out? If you don't have an invitation for people to report a breach of the guidelines, how are you supposed to know? Um, well, like most yeah. Australian regulators that are lazy <laughs> and don't do anything, I got a beautiful auto reply, which was, it said, um, quote, in, this is in part, I can't read out the whole thing. Quote, we will respond to you where we have information that may help you or you have asked a question about your rights or obligations under the energy laws and rules. If this is not the case, we will record the information you have provided, but you may not receive a response. But I did get a response about a month later, and the response was, we receive reports on customer complaints and disputes from energy businesses and ombudsman schemes. We use this oh. information to monitor compliance with the rules. How's that for regulatory capture? They're Hang relying on, so on the businesses to tell them about when they didn't comply. Yeah, like what's <laughs> what the hell is this? Nonsense. Or that someone's already taken it up with the ombudsman and gone through, and the process. ombudsman keep some data on how many complaints, and they give it to these guys. But for me, it's like ah, classic, classic Australian liberal capitalism at work, where you have some sort of inactive maybe lazy not incentivized would be the economic <laughs> right way to um, describe they don't do anything on. they don't do anything yeah if they were serious they would be advertising not just on their website but elsewhere hey got a problem um yeah. tell us about the but breach I'm... of the guidelines but you know what the, their number one priority and i noticed this so which is why i prefaced my email to them with this is not about a dispute with my retailer because their number one priority is to tell you, we don't deal with disputes with retailers. Yeah, I know that, people. I know that's why I'm yeah. explaining to you in this email very clearly that this is not about a dispute with my retailer because that's essentially their all-purpose response mm. to everything. Very annoying. And, um, of course, that couldn't resist saying the same thing in the response to me, although they did very generously note in passing that I already knew this, um, <laughs> but it was a parody of everything that's wrong with um, regulators, frankly. Um, it, it is bizarre, the response. It's, Look, it's, I don't know enough about yeah. what they really do. I only know based on what the email response was. Um, yeah. Parody of everything that's wrong. But um, yeah, I mean, that's how it <laughs> ended. And I just think, I still think I'm less reticent than you about this is just something 
if the government knows what's right for us, what's a fair price, just sell us the bloody electricity and stop all the nonsense around it. Yeah, that, that's, that was the question I asked at this conference back in 2010. If us regulators know what the right thing is to invest in and what the price is, why do we need to privatise all these utilities? Because then we, you know, to regulate them, we need to be, um, have the equivalent knowledge of how to run them perfectly. You know what I mean? Like you don't yeah. solve anything by selling it and then regulating it because if you can regulate it, you could have just owned it and run it the way that you were trying to regulate it. And that, that example happened, I was working in the QCA, the Queensland Competition Authority, and they'd privatised the Central Queensland coal line to haul coal to the ports. And so instead of just a, a national boring train operator with some tracks that ever, all the coal miners paid a fee to, uh, it was now a private company. And, and one of our jobs was to audit them to make sure they weren't preferencing their own trains on the tracks because coal oh, companies wow. could do whatever and and so one of my jobs is to audit and they're like oh just get you know a consultant accountant to audit it and I'm like okay right oh so they'd done it before and and I asked them I'm like well how do you audit this do you know do you surprise visit them and check their records or whatever and they basically said oh we kind of just ask them if they're preferencing their own I'm like so how do you how do we even know this is this a is this theater what we're doing is this audit just theatre so it looks like um, there's oversight when there's no actual way to tell? Uh, and and that, that's one of the reasons I ended up leaving is I couldn't stand the, the theatrics of the regulation uh, rather than the actual doing. That's really right? funny. Yeah, preferencing your own trains. Ah. Yeah, so because they, they can always go, oh, yeah, sorry, there's no slots there to the competitor's train and slide their ones on. Uh, at convenient times when you know ships are moving or whatever the case may be yeah so you know, it's 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 a it's a dilemma i'm telling you but but um the, the dilemma doesn't disappear if you run just one big organization because you have internal incentives in that organization um, this is just the classic a classic mm. dilemma although i do think this rule should be good right if if we had this rule for phone uh, electricity, et cetera. And we had someone who could audit it and go, Hey, I sampled, um, the bills of a thousand customers randomly this, this quarter and 400 of them could have been on a different plan at a better price. It's your obligation to put them on it. Um, and the fine was, you know, thousands of dollars per customer. I think this would be an effective improvement, but it sounds like it's another one of those theatrical guidelines. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm predicting a... that they'll find a way around this new fair system that is supposed to be now in place. But I know we have to wrap mm. up, but um, Yanis Varoufakis said that, um, I don't know, you know, you, if you've been following Yanis Varoufakis, so he's, he's a very impressive yep. guy from my point of view, from um, a former Greek finance minister, but he said like the only thing that they, these people with energy company, retail companies, say you know the only examples they come up with in terms of oh we need to innovate we need to exist to innovate is just like billing like you know how you can have like a smart a smart oh, yeah. um, meter or, or yeah, oh, yeah like okay so let people let people innovate on the apps and use like like with transport you know you, know, you can right. use the government's information and innovate with the apps well, what, what's wrong with yeah, that yeah yeah but like the fact that you've got to structure this enormous edifice of fake um, market with all these bureaucracies just for that is just yeah. What, what kind of crap? No, I think is you're this? right. This is this is where I think economists go too far. I'm like, markets equal innovation. No, that the, the, what the product is matters. Um, where because it, it will incentivize you to innovate on contracts or products, and we want product innovation. Yeah, and with that, we got to wrap up. Otherwise, we kicked off the call. So <laughs> thanks for the chat. Thanks for letting me rant. Great. Good to see you. All right. See you next time. See you. Thanks for listening, everyone.